the director and writer of Dark Phoenix, Simon Kinberg, and producer, Hodge Parker. Okay, so we wanted to warm these nice people up okay. before we show them what you guys have to show them, what you're going to love. And so let's jump in kind of right at the beginning of all of this because as an X-Men fan, I've been teased before, <laughs> okay? Uh, I, I fixed my hair today in what I hoped was the best Dark Phoenix style I could. You did a very good job. Thank you, my name is Gray. Also, I get really mad sometimes. It's spelled right, your last name, but... It's we'll... close enough, thanks for pointing that out. And, <laughs> and so, what made this the moment to finally give this storyline its own film? Um, a lot of things. I think one, the climate for these kinds of movies allows for the drama, the intensity, the character-driven nature of what a Dark Phoenix story needs to be. After we did Logan, after um, all of the different things that are happening in the genre now. Um, and we felt like after the last X-Men movie we made, Apocalypse, which was huge in scale and scope, we wanted to actually tell a story that could do that, but could really be also um, intimate at the same time. And the Dark Phoenix story is this intimate story about, as you know and you all know, um, uh, a central character in Jean uh, who starts to lose control. And that's all it is, really. Uh, it happens to manifest as superpowers in huge destructive ways, but it is about someone who loses control and the people who love her um, some of them want to save her, some of them want to save the world from her, and so it fractures this family around her as she herself is fracturing. So for me as a writer, as an artist, as a filmmaker, telling that story after Logan, telling that story after we had gone huge on Apocalypse, um, it just felt like the right time to tell it. That, as, a, as, a, as somebody who has visited these movies in the theater since they were starting in the 2000s, uh, I think that what keeps being exciting for me is that they all feel different. Like, that's the secret to the sequel. And so, Hutch, especially when you're considering, you know, you were mentioning Logan, Simon. When you're considering something like Logan, could you, would you liken this Dark Phoenix story to anything else? Like, is there, or, or if not, what kind of subgenre of movie would this belong to? Because we already, I mean, I can kind of tell it's not, re based on what you guys are going to see in a minute, it's not what, it's not just an action X-Men movie. Yeah, no. I, I don't know that I would liken it to any other movie. Um, not that I can think of. And I guess it'd be a weird mix between a family drama and, to some degree, I guess, a science fiction story. I mean, you, you've got elements of both. Um, but as you point out, I mean, the, it's very clear to us who, one, the, the underlying material to all of this, you know, to the X-Men universe is pretty incredible. And for all the character-based reasons that Simon was saying, but also because the thematics are so rich, they're so powerful and relatable and, and, and important. <laughs> so with that, you feel an obligation to try to, to reach deeper into the material and and I think, as Simon alluded to, there's there's a lot of great work being done in this arena, and uh, and the table felt like it had been well set to do what Simon has long wanted to do, which is to do a kind of deep dive on Dark Phoenix and do it more thoroughly and more substantively and with with much more detail and nuance. And um, that was exciting to all of us, to the actors, to to myself. I think. Uh, certainly to Fox, so, you know, kind of, it, it, it came up organically, I guess, best way to describe it. I keep, when I think about what we've seen of this so far, which is way too little, by the way, guys, just a note. We don't disagree. <laughs> I, I always go back to Logan because it's so personal, because, you know, my husband was crying. Do not tell him that I told you that. But it, it's a, it's such an emotional story. So, when you're working with the studio, did doing the huge apocalypse movie like pave the way for this? They were like, yeah, man, you can make this one like a, more of a family drama. 
Um, they're very trusting of us in general because we've made so many of these movies now. So um, they they like when we zig after we've zagged on these films. Um, and I think Logan helped pave the way, actually. Uh, and the other part of this film, and you'll see some of it in what we're going to show you, uh, is that what Marvel Studios has done in terms of making these movies um, extraterrestrial, um, taking them into space with Guardians, with Thor Ragnarok, with the Avengers movies, uh, allowed for us to tell the Dark Phoenix story, not just in the dramatic, grounded, emotional ways that we're talking about, that Logan does, but to also go to outer space, to also have alien characters. Um, and I think that's why when Hutch was, when you asked Hutch what the genre is, it's tough to, to, to pinpoint what it is, because it is a combination of something like Logan that is a drama, I mean a western, but really a drama, and something that is larger uh, and more cosmic, for lack of a better description, <laughs> It is, it is um, truly science fiction. Uh, Jessica Chastain plays an alien character in the movie, um, and there are scenes in outer space, and you couldn't have had that in Logan. You couldn't have had an X-Jet in Logan. Nobody wears uniforms in Logan. So it, it is a larger um, canvas than something like Logan, but it, in, in its intention, it has that kind of intensity and that kind of emotionality, and I hope that it makes your husband cry. <laughs> Would you like to set up what you brought for everybody tonight? Sure. Perfect segue. Okay. So my husband cry. <laughs> I don't know if it'll make your this part will make your husband cry because it's early in the movie. Um, you guys are the first to see um, actual continuous footage um, from this film. We're going to show you about I think 13, 14 minutes. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, it is early in the film. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, the X-Men are the X-Men that I'm sure a lot of you know from the comics, where they are actually uh, known to the world and actually, for lack of a less uh, generic term, superheroes. Um, and you see them on a mission and we see part of what starts to create the, the fracture in Gene. Um, uh, so it's got big action, it's also got the drama and the emotion in it. Uh, the only things I will say, in addition to don't fill in on your phone, um, that you heard already, is that the visual effects are obviously not finished. The movie doesn't come out until next summer. Um, but it, they will give you a sense uh, of what it'll look like. Uh, the music is composed by Hans Zimmer. Yes! Said after I forgot which of the DC movies that he would never do another superhero movie, and we convinced him to come back and do this. And 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 the big part of why we convinced him is because of the drama that we're talking about. Um, but even that music is not um, finished, uh, um, and it isn't recorded uh, the way that it'll be ultimately recorded. So um, just know that you're seeing a movie in process, uh, but you are seeing a big chunk of that movie in process. Uh, and I hope you dig it. It's a good thing the mic wasn't on in that moment because all I said was, Ooh! <laughs> What a great note to end on. Uh, you might have noticed we have two empty chairs here at the end. So guys, come on back up and everybody welcome Sophie Turner and Ty Sheridan. <laughs> Sophie, official blanket apology, just in case I accidentally ever go, hey, Jean. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but w at what point were you told that this is going to be Dark Phoenix, therefore centering on your character, finally? The finally was from the fans. I was speaking for us. <laughs> um, I was told uh, about six months before we started shooting the movie, um, Simon kind of took me to lunch and sat me down and 
and told me what the movie was going to be, that it was going to be Dark Phoenix, what that meant, um, what that meant for preparation. Um, and luckily he gave me enough time to prepare. Uh, but it, it was a big undertaking and a lot of pressure, but also such an honor because I know that the fans are so in love with this storyline and, um, and I, I really think that we did it justice. Let's bookmark the preparation that you did. Don't let me forget about going back to that. But tie down there at the end, when we're telling a story about Jean, we're also telling a story about you as well, you know, about Scott. And I'm just going to keep saying you, because you guys are these people. <laughs> so what? Are, so when you first read the script, you know, I know there's not a lot that you can necessarily reveal, but what, where was the emotion for you? Well, I think I was just excited that we were taking a crack at something that was a bit more grounded and a bit more um, human, if you will, even though we're all mutants. <laughs> uh, but it was just, it was really exciting because, as you can see, I mean, this is pretty early on in the movie, and that's kind of the central, um, you know, instance where, where things start to change when uh, when you see what just happened in space. But, um, yeah, I think after things start to unravel um, throughout the film, you know, uh, suddenly my character is, is encountering, uh, he, he's, he's lost the, the love of his life, and she's, you know, she's lost control of herself, and, you know, that's a really hard thing to grasp and swallow, and... So I think it, it, it even splits the X-Men up, you know, so there's a lot of conflict in this movie um, between the X-Men, and, and I think that there's, so you see a bit of uh, fragility that you haven't seen in, in Scott in the past in some of these films, and that was really exciting for me. Hutch, can you talk about how right now might be the perfect time for us to finally have the story? Like socially, like on a on a larger scale, because you kind of can't ignore that kind of thing now. We're so information flows so freely. Yeah, I think I think that's part of what makes <coughs> these movies so resonant in general, specifically the X Men movies, is because they deal um, so directly with alienation and and prejudice and issues that certainly seem inescapable on the news these days. Um, and it's no accident, I think, that Simon wanted to tell this story and, and has empowered uh, the female characters in this story um, in the ways that he has, uh, which is not, it's not to say politically, it's just, it's just a, a natural cultural uh, instinct. Um, and that, that, that's part of what you, I'll say it as a producer, is that you look for in your filmmakers are people who who can see in the underlying material the possibilities to both create relatable circumstances as human beings, but also create relatable uh, metaphors for what's happening in the culture. And and this story is uniquely powerful in that regard. And I would I would say that the choice Simon made in terms of how how he's told this story um, is is perhaps even more so. Yeah, and I mean that's what good sci-fi does. It reflects your real world and helps you understand more about it through a story that might be a little more palatable, perhaps. Oh, well, can't wait. Uh, and finally, you're, <laughs> and you're directing. Yes. Let's talk about that. You're like, yes. Yes. Um, it was great fun. Uh, and, you know, I've been writing and producing for many, many years now, uh, and I've worked with lots of different kinds of filmmakers, not just in the X-Men movies, but they've spanned from filmmakers that needed an immense amount of help, and so I got to sort of... Which ones? Tell us everything. Uh, <laughs> much of it is on record already, so you just just Google it. Um, Not now, because you don't have your phone. No, but, uh, but... So I've got to sort of um, practice direct uh, on, on some big feature movies with directors who, let's say, were um, very collaborative. Um, and then I've also got to just sit back and watch people like Ridley Scott and Ken Branagh um, and Guy Ritchie and Matthew Vaughn and lots of great filmmakers um, who treated me like a partner um, and at the very least allowed me to be present um, for the process. So I learned a lot. I mean, I learned a lot from watching Ridley direct, um, especially the way he interacted with the actors. The respect he had for them and the way he was collaborative with them, especially for someone like that um, who doesn't need to be collaborative with anybody because he's Ridley Scott. Um, and yet he understands that he's part of what's so great about making movies is, and especially when you get to make them with, with great people, and 
uh, you know, the, the best of the best, you have an opportunity to take all of that talent, harness it together, and create something that's greater than anything you could have done on your own. Um, and with this cast especially, if I came to you and said I have a drama or a comedy or any kind of movie or science fiction movie with Ty Sheridan and Sophie Turner and Jessica Chastain and uh, Jennifer Lawrence and Michael Fassbender and James McAvoy and Nicole, you'd be like, that's the greatest cast ever. Uh, and they're in a superhero movie. So I didn't, I, for me, what was exciting about directing, um, in addition to just being able to create the tone of the set and the tone of the movie, which I think is in some ways the, the biggest responsibility of the director, is creating tone, was to play with these actors in a different way um, and to really get in there and collaborate with them and sort of tailor lines to them and listen to their cadences and the way that they, they spoke and find their strengths um, and, and play to them. So, real talk then, having been in another X-Men movie, how was the experience different this time around with Simon as the director, kind of working with you and taking taking the performance apart and building it up in this particular way? Just pretend like he's not here. It's definitely much more engaged and focused all around. It has to be cool because so much of the movie is is not it doesn't it's non-existent when you're shooting it. You know, it's an it's yeah. perhaps an effect later or something like that. I'm sure it helps. Yeah, sometimes, but I think a lot of times, you know, you're the, this story is so uh, grounded in, in uh, you know, drama that it, it's it, that's what it's about. You know, it's, so it's innate in the in the script and in the writing, and um, you know, I think for for us, it was just nice to have someone guiding us and leading us. And it, it's it's a big movie, you know. You really need somebody who can really hone in on a vision and be really specific um, about every little detail. Because if you get one element that's not right, you know, some things start to kind of wander off kilter. And um, I think in, the, in, the, in this film, you know, Simon did such a great job. Uh, I know he's a first-time director, and it's crazy to me to, to think that, you know, he, uh, he accomplished what, what he did in this, in this film. And we all, we all believed in him so much, you know, that I don't think there was ever a doubt from any of the crew or the cast. You know, it was from day one, it was like, you know, we, we were back in the sky and we knew he, he could do it. So... Um, yeah, it was just, it was overall, I think this film was, uh, much, much more, um, much more pleasing to make. That makes sense. I, I think that audiences pick up on things, like if, if there was a day when you maybe didn't ask all the questions about the script, or you didn't see if that felt true to you, that's the kind of stuff that sitting in the seats were like, what? You know, like it comes across, so it's cool. It's cool to think that this is a, a little bit more of a micro-focused style. So that kind of winds back to preparation. Uh, in seeing this clip again, one of the things that fascinates me as a non-actor is that, um, like I just said, a lot of this stuff doesn't exist yet when you're doing it, and so you're really doing a lot of heavy lifting in the acting department. So. Can you talk, Sophie, about how you prepared for this? And like, I'm talking like even nitty gritty, like this is the kind of stuff that I, I'm, I'm speaking for all of us again, like I wanna know. It's like, you're, oh now cosmic rays are f flowing through your body. It's like, what? Yeah, I prepared with a lot of cosmic rays. Um, <laughs> like, a lot of the microwave on a lot. Like, yeah, I used to stand by the microwave and just let them flow into me and feel the power. And then I go scream at my mum for a while and be like, sorry, Dark Phoenix, sorry. Um, no, I, I mean, preparation wise, Simon and I were uh, uh, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for months with. Um, we mainly studied kind of schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder. Uh, when you see the movie or if you've read the comics, you'll know why. Um, and we kind of went back and forth with material like that, um, just educating ourselves. And um, for about two days straight, I had this, um, uh, my, my headphones in and I was listening to this YouTube thing and it was like, what it what it sounds like and what it feels like to be schizophrenic and so I would walk around and try and do my daily chores and jobs and run my errands with voices in my head all day 
which was really interesting and um, I got nothing done. <laughs> um, and then before we even started the movie, I mean, we, we had like two weeks of just like straight rehearsals for hours and hours and hours a day. Just, I mean, it wasn't even rehearsals. It was just talking over like every single line of the script and the dialogue and the action and, um, and really like honing it in and making sure it was what we both felt like it needed to be. And that's the thing about Simon, he's so, so collaborative. Um, and so when you say, you know, if there's something that didn't feel right to you, it comes across to the audience. But I, I think for all of us, by the time that we started shooting this movie, we knew that everything in that script felt right and felt justified. Um, and so that was just such a gratifying experience to do that with with Simon, um, the most collaborative, most wonderful director. You really, I'd imagine that you really need that because it's acting in its best form is very vulnerable to begin with, but especially when you're taking on a certain responsibility, you know, and yeah. portraying a, a character and when you're studying mental illness like that, that's something that's going to be reaching everyone, so. Yeah, absolutely. and. Um, it, I mean, mental illness means means a lot to me personally, um, and so it even more importantly to me. I felt like this movie, you know, so often you can see superhero movies. They can sometimes be a bit like gimmicky and like we're superheroes and we're gonna save the world. But this <laughs> that's um, a great impression. <laughs> <laughs> but this I felt like because it it does um, kind of. Uh, relates so much to the mental illness world that I really felt that everything had to be a very respectful version of what it is and not make it feel gimmicky and it, and it never it never does I don't think and that's what I love about this script is though even though there's that kind of escapism and you have the superhero elements the fantastical elements um, not once does it kind of make fun of it or or make it lighter than it is it's um, it's very real and I love that about this movie. It's, it's kind of heartbreaking, but it's it's uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it seems so far, just seeing that little bit, it can work on those levels. Because, uh, you know, I just need to mention for my own edification that your eyeshadow is banging in that clip. <laughs> <laughs> for any of you out there that care about that kind of stuff, am I right? Yeah. It's Yes, we're getting a lot of applause for the makeup in this. Um, and going back to rehearsal, Simon, is there a member of the cast maybe that couldn't be with us here today that you find is like especially collaborative and kind of excited in in the, those early stages to talk through stuff? I mean, they were all really excited because on, on movies of this scale, for whatever reason, it should be the opposite. But on these big movies, you get the least rehearsal time. On an independent movie, on a smaller movie, you get more rehearsal time, partly, I guess, because you have less shooting time. So you have to be more prepared going in. You don't have three hours in the morning to find the scene. Um, you can't fall behind um, in schedule. Uh, but we had the luxury, especially Sophie and I, and Ty as well, but Sophie and I probably had the most um, rehearsal time together. And like she said, it was like, wasn't running the scenes and playing the scenes so much as um, investigating the scenes. Uh, and like, you know, taking them apart and putting them back together to make sure that they were in the right place and right order for a reason. Um, I would say the person who I might have collaborated with in a similar way, uh, the closest, is Jessica Chastain. Um, Jess is just a, a friend and she's a, someone who was coming to this completely cold. She'd never been in um, any movie that really resembled this before. And so as opposed to Mike Fassbender and James and Nick and Jen, who we've made, this is now the fourth movie made, I've made with them, um, Jessica had lots of questions that started on the sort of superficial science fiction level and then got deeper into the character emotional um, level uh, and uh, and she had a lot of thoughts and we crafted the look together uh, and the, her voicing and even the way that we sort of approached her character because she's many things in this movie in terms of the sort of roles she her character plays but she is in, in ultimately the villain of the film. And we talked about um, how to find a voice for a villain that was unique um, and not like, you know, mustache twirly, because that's not something that, it's not something that Jessica would be attracted to as a, as a great actress. Um, and she came up with this um, sort of metaphor 
of, uh, like, it, it, it's not a fun metaphor, so I warn you in advance, and this might make your husband cry too, but is of the veterinarian who has to give the news that your dog needs to be put down. Um, and in this case, it's more than the dog that needs to be put down um, from her point of view. But that kind of weird, calm, eerie, terrifying um, uh, voicing was just really different and way scarier than her being shrill or being demonstrative or aggressive. Um, and once she sort of s found her way into that, it was like the character locked in. Uh, yeah. That's the kind of voice that I get when there's been like a horrible accident and I turn into a robot all of a sudden and I'm like, where did that come from? Oh, that's great. Uh, that's one of the fantastic things about superhero movies these days is just that they're significant, like, fantastic actors in these movies. It's not, it's like, you're getting, like, can you talk about getting Jessica Chastain in this new film? Because, you know, having all these folks in the film and, you know, people who couldn't be here today, like Fassbender and James McAvoy, it's like, these are legit casts. Powerhouse. Powerhouse cast. And actually, uh, Simon never really thought of anybody else for that role um, and, uh, and wrote it for her had no idea whether she'd really be open to it, but it was one of those moments, and, and as a producer, it makes you nervous because if it doesn't pan out, it's inevitably a much more disappointing moment. Um, and, yeah, that's uh, like naming your movie being John Malkovich, and you haven't asked Malkovich yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly right, right? So, uh, but he did a really great job on the, on the script, as he said, and, and know, knew the movie and the ambition of the movie so well, I think, was able to communicate all of that to Jessica in in the language that made sense to her. So so not that she was necessarily opposed to these movies, but I think the threshold she maintains for what it is she's interested in as an actress is is extraordinarily high. And and I I'd say that's true of all the cast, but but Jessica is I I believe you know if not you know in the top three actresses working today maybe high. I mean she's just an extraordinary actress. So the bar was high, and, and it required Simon, you know, kind of show the goods as a first timer. That's that's challenging, but he did. Yeah, I all I look at these casts, and I'm like, you know, to grab you guys again, and to grab somebody, you know, all these other cast members. These movies have to be intriguing on a different level. So we've reached just about the end of our time today, and before we go, I would like for each of you to choose an X-Men that you would like to be that is not you. Okay, so who have you who have you always related to or whose power is awesome? Pick and give an explanation. And then we will uh, allow everybody to pull out their phones after that. Do you want me to go first so you have time to think yeah. Sure. It's an, easy, it's an easy one for me. Um, Magneto. Um, nice. One, he was my favorite character growing up. Two, he's just a badass. Three, he's Jewish. And we don't have a lot of representation in comic books. So, um, and he's just a complex, uh, fascinating guy whose philosophy makes a lot of sense, but whose actions maybe don't. And that's an interesting dichotomy. Uh, so, but mostly because he's a badass Jew. <laughs> um, I go back and forth, but I think I think in this moment I'm gonna recommit to Wolverine because I mean, and, and part of it I'm gonna confess is because of how long I, I you know longer relationship now I've had with that character, but but it's also because I love the 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 mix of humanity and rage that that coexists and and. The struggle that he undergoes in trying to work that through, to me, is incredibly compelling on a whole bunch of different levels. And the fact that in the end he can kick your ass, I really like too. So the combo <laughs> is probably going to lock me in there. Yeah, well we bought you as much time as we can. <laughs> I still wasn't enough. <laughs> um, I also like to think I'm just as ripped as Wolverine, but... Um, <laughs> I don't know, this is something that you, Hutch, said earlier in, a, in another interview, uh, which I thought was really interesting, um, kind of going back and forth between uh, Professor X and Magneto, 
in the way that they're kind of a bit like MLK and Martin, uh, Malcolm X, um, I feel like I kind of go back and forth between them, striving to do the right thing, but do it, doing it in vastly different ways and can't quite decide and feel like I'm either one or the other. Um, so I don't really know. Maybe I'm just like Jean, actually. I'm probably just a bit unhinged. <laughs> and to, to also point out, Wolverine could not handle close proximity to a microwave, the adamantium, I'm pretty sure. Like, pretty positive. Okay, Ty, wrap it, wrap okay. it up for us. Uh, uh, we'll do it quickly. Jean Grey. Oh, She's just got it going on. <laughs>